The vision of the Bonner Trust is gospel workers for the church in Scotland. That's a biblical vision. And as such, it is fundamentally dependent on the Lord and on the Lord's power. Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. Such earnest prayer is born of challenging times. Scotland, with its rich Christian heritage, is now one of the most secular countries in Europe. Secularism has swept into Scotland. The National Church, the Church of Scotland, the Kirk, is in terminal decline. Recent decisions constitute a, a rejection of the Bible, the Word of God as the supreme rule of faith and life. Challenging times felt right across the country, in the borders, in the cities, in the highlands, in the islands. Yeah, the borders is much like a lot of Scotland, um, especially out with Glasgow and Edinburgh, where you have you know, scores of faithful Christians who love the Lord. And yet many of them are in uh, churches which have no minister, struggling in churches who have uh, ministers who, who don't believe the gospel, don't teach the gospel. Uh, the Borders, I don't think, has ever historically been one of those places in Scotland that's had healthy, really strong, vibrant work. You know, it's not one of those places you hear that had a revival. And so the nature of it then has been uh, that there's very few disconnected churches. Um, to put it in context, Craig, who's planting a, a new free church in the area, that's the first free church in the area for over 100 years. And so there's not been a lot of uh, healthy variety and then across the variety that has been here, there's not always necessarily been a lot of actual gospel church health. And so you've got 115,000 people on the borders. You could probably fit on one hand the gospel number of gospel churches here, broadly speaking, within the borders. And so a huge area geographically um, with tens of thousands of people with, with little to no access to a gospel church. So that's resulted in a wider scene in, in the borders where there might be a whole town that's quite distinct in its geography and identity of six, 7,000 people that might not have a healthy gospel church in the middle of it. People will know now Aberdeen for city centre churches that have been closed and turned into nightclubs. And that's what you find on a Friday night. You know, they'll even use words like soul bar or soul food. They'll play off the church name and they're doing something very different to church. And Christianity. So that's to our shame to some extent. And we've got to say, how do we turn that situation around? The needs of the gospel are huge here. When you get to Aberdeenshire, rural ministry is really tough. I've been uh, trying to work with some local church planters who have gone to rural Aberdeenshire and just hard ground, hard hearts. So you don't, I don't think anybody uh, can miss the need. The need is absolutely enormous. Mm -hmm. Birkhead is a fishing village. About 1,800 to 2,000 people live here, so it's not a huge place. It's a typical, um, you know, smallish coastal fishing village in this part of the world. Uh, spiritually, well, a lot of the coastal places in Murray have a, a history, a, a quite a vibrant history of, um, of Christian faith and also of revival. So today we're just about 100 years on from um, the, the East Coast Fishermen's Revival, uh, which had a, a big impact in this part of the world. But really since then, you would say that was the high point in recent years anyway, of, of spiritual life and of church membership here and, and elsewhere. The rest of the 20th century really was a, a story of, of decline and quite major decline uh, in, in this church and in most churches around the area. So when I arrived in uh, 2015, we, we came to a church which was on the verge of closure with an uncertain future. You know, lots of places are like this, uh, perhaps some a vibrant spiritual heritage, but a long time in the past. And uh, now many churches which are in decline, facing closure, 
um, you know, a rural economy which faces challenges. This is real life in much of rural Scotland. The spiritual heritage of Lewis is a fascinating story because in many ways the gospel came here quite late. Um, if you think of Scotland as a whole, uh, you, you can think back 500 years since the Reformation and see, uh, see God at work in many of the communities. Um, that work of the gospel was quite late in coming to Lewis. But when the gospel came here in the, the 19th century with a sense of vigour that it didn't really have before, it was really embraced and the churches here grew um, and the gospel became woven into the fabric of the life and culture in our communities in a beautiful way. And in particular, there were times of real um, amazing blessing. Here in our village in Carloway, um, almost a hundred years ago, there was a, a revival uh, where God did amazing things uh, in, in bringing people to faith. The same thing happened about 30 years later in Barvis, which is just about uh, 10 miles north of us here. So because we have such a rich spiritual heritage, it's easy to look back into the past and see that as the ideal, that as the gold standard, and that as the model of church life that, that we should maintain. We forget that actually the Church of Jesus Christ has always had to um, take the same gospel message but communicate it in a way that's relevant to the culture around us. We now have communities around us that really are unchurched, and we are now sitting in a mission field where we have to reach out to people who, who know nothing about Jesus and who are starting from zero with their biblical knowledge. And uh, we need to be ready as churches to welcome these people in, to disciple them, and to equip them to go out and reach the others who are in our communities. People come to know the Lord Jesus through the people of the Lord Jesus, that the church is the mission agency of God. And so if there's not a healthy gospel community in the town you live in, how are you going to hear about Jesus? Who's going to tell you? Who's going to show you the love of God? And so it's our desire to see that radically reversed, that there would be a healthy gospel church in every town, in every community across the borders. And we're a long way from that just now. The vision of a healthy gospel church for every community in Scotland is dependent fundamentally on the power of God. Such a vision is beyond any one denomination or grouping to deliver. It can only be achieved through generous gospel partnership. Encouragingly, we're seeing that kind of gospel partnership increasingly evident already in the country. And in that context, the green shoots of a coherent gospel vision and strategy are beginning to emerge. Our goal is the, the re-evangelization of Scotland to the glory of God. Uh, the means is through local churches, a healthy gospel church for every community in Scotland. Church planting will be a vital catalyst to this through networks like Generation and Pillar. But alongside church planting, we need to see lots of church revitalization and the resourcing of strong and established churches. And underpinning all of that, the need is for gospel workers to lead and serve in these churches. Gospel workers who are convinced of the power, the authority, and the proclamation of the Word of God as being the way that God will work to change lives. If the vision of the Bonner Trust is gospel workers for the church in Scotland, what's the strategy? The strategy is simple. Get the right approach to training and then replicate that the length and breadth of the country. The recent turbulent period in Scotland's spiritual landscape and history has afforded the opportunity to really think carefully about how we train gospel workers. Two core convictions underpin how we should train gospel workers. And the first is that the heart of gospel ministry is the prayerful teaching of the Bible. And so training needs to equip people to preach and to teach the Bible and to teach others to teach uh, the Bible, to release the word through the life of the church. And the second conviction is that the primary responsibility for training rests with the local church. Well, fundamentally, God is the one who raises up and sends out gospel workers. That's why we need to be praying. But the, the place that God raises up gospel workers is in local churches. And that's why alongside praying, we need to do whatever we can 
to develop a training culture in every local church in Scotland. At its essence, it's just investing in the lives of people, doing our best to equip every Christian in our church families to be a disciple maker. But then within that context, what we'll find is that people with genuine word ministry gifts emerge in our local churches. And then we want to give them opportunities to teach God's word to others. And then over time, from among those who are teaching God's word in the context of a local church will emerge those who begin to consider whether that's something they're going to do full or part-time. The, the model or approach to training that the Bonner Trust, working with others, who have been trying to develop has been called partnership training by some. You can think of it as two parallel railway tracks that go all the way through someone's time in training. And the beauty of partnership training is that it complements that theological education with experience in the life and the real life of a local church. And that's brilliant for their development as they seek to uh, grow in their, their competence for the work of ministry, but also for their character development as they, uh, they see how the challenges um, and issues that, that can arise in a, in a local church um, are tackled um, in the light of the, the gospel and all that we've learned. Oh, the, the best way to train. One of the benefits of that is you're constantly asking the question of so what? What, what does this mean pastorally, practically? And so having that constant connection between the two was, was really helpful. Just learning those pastoral instincts as well, having seen it lived and breathed and the, the benefits of that. You know, trusting that ultimately God's word does God's work. So sticking with that and knowing faithfully doing that for years is what will, what has uh, grown the church. What does partnership training look like practically? Well, at the foundation level, a two-year ministry apprenticeship in a local church in partnership with an external training provider. Now, the local church-based component is training in Bible confidence, Bible handling, putting that into practice in real life ministry uh, across the life of a church and getting feedback on that Bible teaching. But alongside that, a strong emphasis on growth in godliness and in servant-heartedness. Really important stuff for a lifetime of ministry. During that apprenticeship, my view of God, of the Bible and of the church was really ironed out quite a lot and uh, a lot of my thinking became clearer. The external uh, training component, a course like the Cornhill Training Course in Glasgow, with a strong focus on word ministry. Folks gather together, there's classroom teaching, and there's also lots of opportunities for the individuals to engage in Bible teaching, uh, to do uh, short talks, to do longer talks, and to get feedback from their peers and from the leaders of the course that they might improve and develop and sharpen up their skills in Bible teaching. And what the external training component of the apprenticeship offers is networking of individuals. They get to meet with their peers and friends across different structures, constituencies, denominations, and really grow a network of gospel partnership for the future. The advanced leader in training or minister or pastor in training program, usually over three or four years, an individual will train and serve and work in the life of a local church. And a core component is mentoring. Time spent with a church leader to read the Bible together, to think about ministry, to share experience, to pray uh, together. Above everything, we want someone to continue growing in love for and likeness to the Lord Jesus Christ. Growth in godliness, the formation of character, is absolutely essential. It has been beneficial for me, and I think it's beneficial for lots of people, is that it gives you a chance to um, grow God willing in character. Um, so much of Paul's commands to Timothy about what an elder should look like and therefore what someone working in church leadership should be like uh, all revolve around their character um, as much as around um, their gifting and that just takes time character growth just takes time and it takes uh, intentional mentoring but of course we want them to 
grow as a preacher and teacher of God's Word as well. Opportunities to preach to a congregation they know and love. Opportunities to teach others to teach the Bible. We want them to gain experience of real leadership in the local church context. And over a three or four year period, lots and lots of invaluable experience. All of this is in partnership with an external training provider. And at the more advanced level, that would be theological study, somewhere like uh, Edinburgh Theological Seminary, or the pastor's training course in Glasgow, or Crosslands training. And what an individual gets to do in, in their theological study is have time to really think through issues like systematic theology, practical theology, church history, biblical languages, as a complement to what they are learning uh, on the ground and putting into practice in the local church. After 20 years of being a teacher, you know what good teaching looks like. And I had two years of fantastic teaching at Cornhill Training Course. And so it was only natural to look at this and think, well, this can only get better, focusing full time on theological thinking, realizing that PTC was going to step this up as about creating a community of believers learning together. I've seldom experienced in an educational setting such fellowship as I have at PTC. Anyone I need to turn to, they would be there for you. They share, we care for each other. And that's what PTC is all about, learning together under God's word. It's one thing to preach a sermon every other week. It's another thing to preach a sermon every week. It's one thing to care for and disciple one or two people. And it's another thing to oversee uh, the growth into maturity of a whole church. I've enjoyed putting into practice all the theory that I've been learning over at ETS, um, thinking through um, strategically how best to, to care for and disciple a whole church, how best to evangelize to a whole community, how best to um, preach and teach from God's word, and how best to equip the members of a church to go on and do the same for one another. So it's very possible that a, a leader in training may train in two churches over that four year period. Uh, we're seeing more and more of this happening and there can be real benefits to it. Yeah. Um, I'm really glad that my training has been spread out um, between Carloway Free Church um, and before that St Andrew's Free Church. Every church is different and those two churches are, are really different. Um, they both have the same gospel at their heart, their same passion to reach the lost and, and make disciples um, and teach them and send them out. Um, but they're in very different places. I think if someone is just training in one church uh, and then goes st straight into ministry, there's a risk that uh, they think that that one way of doing church is the way. And coming to Carloway has been brilliant in seeing the same gospel principles being put into practice in a different place. So I'm preaching a lot more here than I was in St Andrews. That step up in responsibility has been really helpful for my own growth and confidence. And through all of this, uh, a leader in training is going to be applying what they're learning in their theological studies to the practice of ministry. The two go hand in hand together and complement one another brilliantly. And that's the genius of doing pastor in training, not just theology degree and then assistantship. Because then you've got three years where you think, oh, let me try and remember what was that thing? Whereas this was, you hear it in a lecture, you walk down the hill from the mound in Edinburgh and you get to see where it goes. You get to see how it works and you constantly join the dots. What you just learned in the seminary classroom and think about how, how do you teach the doctrines of God well to somebody of this age or that stage and you're out on a visit with somebody and you realize, oh, this thing that I heard about the heart of Jesus towards such is great for this situation. So it was, it's being applied by the process. And so it, we should never divorce the Christian Academy and the Christian church. They, they need each other and they work best to train people for ministry together. At the end of that period of training, um, hopefully we'll end up with, with leaders, ministers 
who are, who are well-rounded, who know the scriptures well, um, who are grounded in good theology, but who are also experienced um, in pastoral ministry, in pastoral care, in preaching, in small group leading, thoroughly equipped you know, for every good work as they are leaders in, in Christ's church. It doesn't just benefit the, the candidate, it also is hugely beneficial to the local church because it invests the local church in the training of ministers. And then to see the, the, the incredible um, uh, reward of that person being sent uh, into pastoral ministry in a congregation that's, that's got no minister. And I guess that's why the word partnership is so helpful because you've got um, a local congregation, a seminary, and an individual trainee and their family all partnering together to walk through this journey into ministry for the glory of Jesus. Partnership training has become the established model of training gospel workers in Scotland. It's got the energy and the heart of the uh, emerging generation of leaders behind it. What we need to pray now and help facilitate, and the Bonner Trust is there simply to facilitate this, not to do this, is to see this vision uh, for training in the local church uh, with this model of training spread out across the country. As it becomes established in more areas, you see a momentum begin to grow. And that comes through those who are being trained, because those who are, who are trained according to the partnership model um, will, will often be eager to implement that model in the congregations that they go to serve in. But also, other congregations see what's happening and they're enthused by it. Being in training churches the past eight years, I'm convinced that I want training to be part of whatever church I'm in. I see the great need in Scotland and it's something I'd want to be part of in raising up that next generation of, um, of men and women to serve in the harvest field. I think one of the most important or most helpful things about this model of training is that it replicates itself. So you've got someone like Andy Robertson in a scheme and Andy is a marvellous exegete both of the Bible and of the culture. And Andy could easily do a city centre student church, but he can also do a schemes church. We're seeing that with Craig Anderson and Gala Shields. You know. So these are guys that are able to adapt their skills into the various situations that Scotland throws at them. I see guys who are passionate about the city, guys who are passionate about church planting, but I also see guys who are passionate about the highlands and islands, passionate about rural communities. There's a, there's a huge passion uh, to reach our nation, whether that's right in the middle of Glasgow or way up here in Carloway. I'm impressed by the character of the men who are training for ministry, that they have a humble spirit, that they have got a servant spirit. And I think then as we start to think about training people for the future of gospel ministry, to know that there's other folk alongside in similar contexts who are looking to train people as well, uh, that we might develop a little bit of a, a training mindset and a training program for what works in our kind of area. One of the benefits of Planting Church is you get to set your DNA from the start and one of our values is, is training. There don't have to be free church congregations, we want to help plant them. If Martin Hoyk is looking to plant somewhere. Man, we will pray for them, we will support for them, because ultimately we're here, we're here for Jesus. There's a limit to what one or two people can do or one or two churches can do, but to see multiple churches that are training multiple people for gospel ministry, to me is what's it beginning to happen and what can develop even more over the next five years, that there might be a network of vibrant, healthy gospel churches of different denominational backgrounds but committed to the same core things uh, across the borders, that wherever you are in the borders, you have a chance of coming to know the Lord Jesus. For that, that time, the past 10, 12 years, there has been a growing momentum and a growing uh, infrastructure around those programmes, that there is a network, informal though it may be at the moment, of pastors across the country or folks who are in their early stages of ministry across the country who share those convictions and are keen to throw a shoulder to the plough together. 
Bonner's played a wonderful role in, in strengthening those ties um, amongst the generation of men who are coming through the chain for ministry. Our job is not to protect the gospel, our job is to unleash the gospel. And that means unleashing our best people so that in my context in Deeside and Aberdeen, if there were three or four young guys who could fill some of the pulpits of the north coast of Scotland or the west of Scotland where they're just longing for an enthusiastic Bible-based preacher, then wouldn't that just be wonderful? It's a wonderful thing to be clear on the fact that, uh, that God is sovereign, that God is a speaking God, and that His Word is active and powerful, and, and it's powerful to change people. Yeah, money is absolutely fundamental because it's more than money, it shows support, it shows love. I think we've got to have gospel generosity and I think in all the people I've seen being sponsored by the Boner Trust, every single one of them, I think without exception, have been a great investment. And, you know, what better way to invest than, than the kingdom? It's, it's eternal. It's an investment that will go on for eternity. The support from the Bonner Trust has been essential. Without the Bonner Trust, I wouldn't be here. Absolutely essential to get me where I am just now. I did not have to get a part-time job. It has meant that both myself and my wife and now my child have been provided for. Having a minister in training would have been impossible without the Bonner Trust. The financial side is the obvious side, but it's actually much more than that. It's deeper than that. They were really, really helpful to us not just with funding, but with advice and with help, as I was beginning to think about what would it look like to have a minister in training, not in a huge church in a big city, but in, uh, in a normal place, if I can put it that way. The funding from Bonner Trust has allowed me to not have to do work outside of church and study, which has transformed my life, transformed the study. So they did it directly, financially um, supporting me in that sense, but also indirectly. Um, the Bonner Trust helped to link me up with, with, um, with other funding sources, so particularly with patrons, gospel patrons, who helped to support me as I was um, studying and working as a minister in training. Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Pray earnestly, to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers, gospel workers, into his harvest field. Wonderfully, the Lord is answering that prayer. He is calling and churches are training and sending out gospel workers. that all across the country, from the borders to the highlands and the cities, in university towns and housing schemes and villages, rural, urban communities, local churches with a vision to train and send out gospel workers. Generous, networked with one another with this larger vision in view. The Trust supports people training across different constituencies, people training in independent churches, Baptist Brethren Churches, people training in and for ministry in the Free Church of Scotland or the International Presbyterian Church or other Presbyterian groupings like the Didasco Fellowship. What matters is not the label on the door primarily. What matters are key and shared gospel convictions like a confidence in the preaching and teaching of the Word of God as the means of changing people's lives. Now such a spirit of generosity, such a spirit of collaboration and partnership is key to seeing a healthy gospel church in every community in Scotland. It's an exciting story. It's a story that needs real gospel generosity in all sorts of ways. Will you be part of that story?